morning, everyone. Welcome to our session on maximizing the value of water for people and the environment. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session to explore this really interesting topic. And we've got a great lineup of speakers today uh, who are going to give different perspectives on the issue. And my name is Louise Ellis. I'm an associate director at Arup. Um, and I work in the area of water risk and resilience. So the purpose of this session is to explore how we can use the total value of water to drive improvements for society and the environment. And by the total value of water, we mean focusing not only on its economic value, but also on its value for society and the environment, which spans multiple sectors, including health, energy, nature, agriculture, and communities. We're gonna be exploring this session through four lenses. The first, a water company, a water utility perspective, and Guy Thompson, who is the Group Director of Environmental Futures at Wessex Water and Managing Director of Entrade, and we'll be talking on that topic. We'll then hear from Brooke Atwell to talk about a partnership perspective. And Brooke is an Associate Director in Resilient Watersheds at the Nature Conservancy. We'll then hear from Joe Shuttleworth to provide a project perspective. Joe's our global water digital skills leader at Arup. And finally, from Bart, we'll be talking about the regulator perspective. So how can we take the total value of water investment into account? There are a number of different frameworks that we can use, and sometimes they can be used in combination or in isolation. Today, we're gonna to look at a number of these. Some of them you'll be familiar with, such as the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and the EU taxonomy, which is used for looking at the value of investment across multiple areas. Um, but we'll also be exploring in more detail things like the multi-capitals approach, uh, as well as catchment markets. I'm gonna do a brief dive into the capitals approach, and then Guy's gonna cover catchment markets in a little bit more detail. So what do we mean by a multi-capitals approach? A multi-capitals approach means not just looking at the financial and manufactured value of water, those things that we traditionally include in cost benefit analysis, but broadening that out to include things like natural, social, human, and intellectual capital. And if we just see the example on the bottom of the screen there, which is a new reservoir de uh, development, you see that typically we might look at the cost benefit of this scheme on things such as financial and manufactured value of the water storage for customers and their clean water supply. But we can also look at it from a perspective of the natural capital of the wetlands that may be implemented as part of the scheme, the social capital of um, being able to go and, and experience a, a beautiful destination and to have the amenity value of a picnic and a play area, the natural capital around um, being able to have kind of the views and the landscape value and then finally, the human capital, so through active recreation and also education. And we can map these benefits across the capitals for different nature-based solutions. And we see actually they begin to really stack up uh, and provide an additive effect on those kind of traditional um, values in terms of economic and manufactured um, value. And what that does is enable us to kind of push those schemes over that cost benefit fit threshold and also potentially um, reprioritize options when looking at um, different projects. On the screen, we've got a number of different benefits that we can consider. Things like air quality, biodiversity and ecology, carbon sequestration, flooding, water quality, having flows in water courses, groundwater recharge, and treatment of wastewater. So why should we adopt this approach? Well, firstly, it supports a much more informed, holistic and sustainable investment decisions that can provide overall value and maximize that overall value for customers, wider society and the environment. For customers, it promotes that nature-based societal, societally beneficial solutions. For shareholders, it helps kind of improve transparency around that shareholder reporting, uh, encourages um, the definition of wider benefits and, and un unlocks partnership opportunities. It allows us to see who benefits and therefore who could contribute to the funding of a scheme. For investors, it provides the opportunity to attract ESG investment. And for a water utility, it aligns the, the decision making process with their overall long term sustainability objectives. And finally, for regulators, it helps to provide that evidence of the wider benefits 
that the water sector is providing. And there's different maturities of this approach that we can take. We can go from taking a very qualitative approach, so having purely a description of the benefit, through to something that's semi-quantitative, so for example, using something like multi-criteria analysis, through a quantitative where we use different data to compare options all the way through to monetization. And it's worth saying that these can also be used in combination. So you may choose to have a monetization alongside a qualitative assessment of the benefit, noting that some things shouldn't necessarily have a monetary value placed upon them. It's also important to consider how this is used through the life cycle of a project. There's the potential to maximize the opportunity to add value very much at the start of the project. So when you're prioritizing the need or prioritizing the options, that's where there's the potential to make the biggest change and include the most benefits in a solution. But it can also need to feed through into project design, making sure that we don't value engineer out or cost engineer out some of these wider benefits, as well as into benefits realization so that we can track the value that these schemes provide um, uh, for society and the environment. So taking this kind of identify, quantify, value and appraise, plan, realize and review approach allows us to do that. So just to illustrate how this might stack up when we look at a gray solution versus a kind of nature-based solution. On the screen, you can see that this is a, an option looking at CSO spills. And you can see that the first option is to put in some larger storage tanks, whereas the second option might be to provide uh, some green attenuation space. And you can see that, you know, traditionally, if we just looked at the financial and manufactured columns, um, we'd just be looking at things like consent compliance, pollution incidents, environmental impacts purely from a financial standpoint. So that might mean things like what's the fine to the water utility um, if they don't, um, if they pollute the water force. However, if you take into account the nat natural, social, human and intellectual benefits, you find that you can include things like what's the social value of pollution? What's the social value of providing additional green space? What's the value of having additional recreation space that people can um, go and enjoy? That's a kind of relatively qualitative perspective, but just looking at it from a more monetized perspective, this is a case study um, of that particular CSO. And just to give a little bit of, of, of an introduction, the CSO is a high spiller. Its WFD status is moderate due to kind of barriers to fish migration, urban development, sewage discharge. And those two options are the options that we're considering online underground storage or rebeds with additional landscaping, rerouting of footpaths and creating amenity in the area. And if we look at the optioneering, you can see that the capex of the traditional solutions, 1.5 million, the nature-based solutions almost double the cost at 3 million. But when we look at the benefits, we see that actually under traditional, yes, actually you do the, you do the traditional solution, the benefit cost ratios, 7.6. Uh, and um, under the traditional decision-making process for nature-based solutions, it's 3.8, it's, it's almost, it's half as cost beneficial. But if you bring in some of those wider benefits, that benefit cost ratio changes quite significantly to put those green solutions at the top of the list. So just in summary, before I hand over to Guy, there are several different approaches to assessing the total value of water investment. They should and, and can be used in combination. A multi capitals approach, which I've described this morning, and supports more informed, sustainable investment decisions and aims really to provide that best overall value for customers, wider society and the environment. And it shouldn't just be used at one point in time. The important and the value that can be provided is using it throughout the project to track benefits and ensure that they're realised. I'm now going to hand over to Guy, who's going to talk through the water utility perspective. Uh, Guy is going to talk about delivering greater value for customers, communities and the environment through out outcome-based environmental regulation and a catchment markets approach. Over to you, Guy. Lovely. Thanks very much, Louise. Good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry for those of you in Stockholm, I can't be with you in the room. Um, just uh, a few thoughts from me building on Louise's presentation. I'm going to start with a sort of macroeconomic context and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to be unapologetically UK centric in my remarks as obviously a water utility based in the UK. Touch on the um, experience we have in, in, in Wessex Water of innovating with catchment markets to deliver uh, greater value to our customers and communities and, and then perhaps um, uh, reflect on uh, what that 
um, what what the implications of our experience might be for water utility uh, your water utility businesses across the globe. Um, so just coming to the UK context, we've had something of a summer of discontent here in the, in the UK. Um, we're in the in the in the teeth of a cost of living crisis, rising energy prices, um, and and very specific specifically to the water sector, um, there have been some very vocal campaigns on um, issues around river pollution, um, and and now um, uh, some uh, a, a fallout from what what it, what looks increasingly likely to be a um, a drought. Um, and, and therefore, privatised water utilities in the UK context have been in the eye of a storm uh, like never before. Um, and there's a real need for us to rebuild trust uh, and strengthen the partnership between uh, regulated utilities and, and the public. And the message we're getting from the public and the campaigners and indeed regulators in the government could not be clearer um, in the in the UK context water utilities the English water utilities need to raise their game on the water environment uh, and we, we must rebuild public public trust um, but water utilities can also help grow uh, local economies and enable sustainable development of their communities and, and we can play our part in delivering net zero improving the natural environment and ensuring that bills are affordable to all and that it is that multifaceted interconnected set of challenges that in, in a 21st century context that I think we need to turn our minds to um, uh, in, in this in this discussion and, and consider you know, how how water utilities can be better incentivized to create that that value um, to deliver on that set of challenges so um, if I could turn to my um, first slide louise is somebody driving them for me lovely thank you um so i mean the, the context here is that um, building on building on those uh, opening reflections um clearly water companies pr provide essential um, public services um uh, and in the in, in an english context that's financed by private capital and, and is heavily regulated now in the um uh, beginning of this decade, uh, beginning of the last decade, the, the UK government committed to being the first generation to leave the environment in a better place, a really you know, a big, um, audacious goal. And, and in 2016, published um, a plan, a 25 year plan uh, on which it um, proposed to deliver on that goal uh, and, and, and has um, subsequently uh, legislated through the Environment Act to adopt targets, binding targets to deliver each of the 10 goals that sit behind that 25 year environment plan. And in a water system context, um, utilities and regulators bear joint risk in delivering the aims of that plan. Um, if we don't take a radical approach to simplify regulation and, and drive efficiency, then I think there's a very real uh, risk that none of us will meet meet our obligations or indeed the growing societal expectations that I touched on at the beginning of my presentation. And I guess the context from a water industry perspective is the, is, is the financial one where you know, the scale of the challenge um, is and, and is very substantially beyond the resources available from public and philanthropic funding alone. So the Treasury uh, the UK Treasury lately um, published a, a review by Professor Dasgupta, um, which is quoted there on the right hand side of, of University of Cambridge, looking at um, where, why the underinvestment in nature occurs and, um, and, 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 and uh, observing that it comes as a result of deep rooted, widespread institutional failure. So the opportunity is to leverage water company investment um, to close the gap um between to, to deliver um the uh the investment required um for the environmental improvement um uh and just just to throw a, a, a number into that a couple of numbers into that equation um we are investing five billion pounds of water companies and uh, water customers money on environmental improvements over the course of this regulatory cycle um the government has a um a stretch target to deliver um 500 million pounds of private investment in nature recovery by 2027 so we could make a very substantial contribution to closing that gap look at the next slide then if we look at the um if we look at the challenge through the lens of water catchments they make it they make a very good um they give us a very good perspective on the challenge so um water catchments are what economists call common pool resources by by which we mean it's very difficult to limit access to them but their supply is limited uh, meaning they can be depleted over time um, so abstracting water, discharging pollutants create negative externalities. And because private costs are lower than the true social costs, 
catchments are prone to overuse and, uh, uh, and, and, and over pollution. So the case for regulation is very clear. Without intervention, every individual player in a catchment can overconsume and underinvest, reflecting their own private interests, but not the interests of society as a whole. And that results in overconsumption and a depletion of the common pool resource and, and what's known uh, by economists as the tragedy of the, economy, of the, of the commons. So catchments require a, a holistic approach to regulation. Turning to the next slide, we've looked at this um, closely through the lens of the existing regulatory framework in the UK. Now, water regulation in, 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 a, in the UK post privatisation has worked well in driving private investment in um, uh, in our assets in, 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 and, and in improving uh, river and coastal water quality. Um, but it's become overcomplicated and obscure and drives increasingly perverse behaviours and regulatory gaming. Um, it, it targets site specific asset actions to drive uh, service improvements and those targets can force companies to implement solutions that increase carbon for example in the middle of a nature in the middle of a climate emergency and they do nothing for biodiversity in the middle of a nature emergency and indeed risk pushing up bills in the, in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Now regulation should be an enabler of, not a constraint to ambition. Um, and to realize that we simply can't iterate the existing model. We need a, a reset. The regulatory framework we have fails because it's fragmented across sectors. It's output, not outcome focused, um, and it's overly, overly prescriptive. So we've, we've looked at that um, with Frontier Economics and we've come up with a solution which is um, uh, summarised on the next slide, um, which we've come to describe as outcome-based environmental regulation, OBA for short. Outcome-based regulation can meet the goals of the 25-year environment plan in a far more efficient way and deliver a, a virtuous circle of, of benefits, including improving the environment for lower and uh, lower private and social cost and encouraging cross-sector collaboration, um, increasing public value, enabling investor value, and, and facilitating private investment in the environment. So in a UK context, we're arguing that the Environment Act, with uh, bringing in binding targets um, uh, on the, uh, in, onto legis into legislation, long-term binding targets, provides a basis for implementing outcome-based regulation. And it could be applied and tested in the water sector by setting those targets at a catchment scale, and incentivizing the uh, delivery of those outcomes by leveling the playing field. So the economic regulator needs to level the playing field of incentives to enable it. Um, but it could ultimately be rolled out um, as, a, as an economy-wide opportunity to all sectors to drive green growth and investment and deliver the goals of the 25-year environment plan. Now, looking at that in the next slide through a water company perspective, as I mentioned at the outset, um, the environmental challenges faced by catchments are interrelated and complex, so a holistic approach is required. And for example, traditional asset based solutions that are illustrated on the left hand side of that um, slide, um, a nitrate removal plant, a phosphorus removal um, dosing um, plant, um, can, whilst they can improve river water quality, they may increase carbon emissions and negatively affect biodiversity. Whereas nature-based solutions reflected and illustrated on the right-hand side of that um, slide could achieve the same outcome um, while also delivering wider environmental benefits in the form of um, biodiversity gain, uh, reduced flood risk and, and carbon sequestration. In the middle of that slide, we've got some of the um, more suboptimal but um, well-intentioned um, uh, outcomes that we've sought to uh, achieve through our, our, our innovation with farmers uh, in our catchments um, uh, through catchment management. But the, the risk is those um, incentives aren't actually delivering the widespread, the, 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 um, the, the optimal um, suite of environmental improvements that could be achieved through nature-based solutions. Um, so we're working to accelerate the journey we're going on from asset-based solutions uh, to nature-based solutions. And we're doing that through um, through catchment markets. Now, um, the next slide looks at the role of a uh, role of markets, and, and that really this 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 concept originated from the work that um, we led with the Broadway Initiative um, in the um, context of the uh, the COVID pandemic, looking at how we could accelerate private investment in the nature recovery to close that gap, I the finance gap I touched on at the beginning of my presentation, and the present the the demonstrations that Wessex Water is running. 
um, enables us to test um, that concept in the real world on the ground. It's led in turn to a, a coalition um, which is um, uh, looking at how we can uh, uh, um, if, we, if you can turn to the next slide, um, called the Financing Nature Recovery um, Coalition, where we brought 300 experts together across the country to look at the current barriers to private investment in nature um, and, and, and setting out a framework um, illustrated on the right hand side of that slide for what needs to be done if um, markets for nature based environmental services are to become a major driver of nature recovery in the UK. So just closing on the real world experience we've got um, of trialing the concept um, and the next slide looks at the um, uh, the cash and market concept which is essentially about um, bringing together the the sellers of uh, nature-based projects so farmers and land owners who are willing to um, uh, to, to um, develop a project on their land um, which can generate um, environmental services with the buyers of those services be they the water company or, for example, um, developers um, with a requirement to, um, uh, to deliver um, nutrient reduction or biodiversity gain, either through a regulatory or, or, or a, um, a voluntary commitment. And that market enables by reducing the um, transactional costs between the buyers and sellers, reducing the friction um, and, and uh, critically um, uh, by um, enabling a, a single market operator, in this case, um, Entrade, a subsidiary of, of Wessex Water, to act as the market maker, market operator. Um, uh, it enables a more efficient um, uh, approach to incentivizing the land use change and therefore um, overcoming some of the barriers um, we're currently experiencing in the regulatory framework to uh, using nature-based solutions to deliver our regulated obligations. Um, and then finally, um, just to talk about where, the, where, we're, where we're applying the concept. So um, Entrade is the market operator in this context, a subsidiary of Wessex Water. It's evolving from a, um, a, a, um, a pilot project, um, which was an avoided cost, avoided capex um, project in the Pool Harbour catchment. Um, in the Wessex catchments, um, we are now uh, experimenting with um, catchment markets in two locations, in the Somerset catchment and in, in the Bristol Avon catchment, um, collaborating with, in one case, a local planning authority to enable a market for um, nutrient reduction. Um, which will enable housing development to progress, but also improve the resilience of that catchment and, and reduce the diffuse water pollution uh, currently affecting that catchment. And in another context, working with two wildlife trusts to leverage a green a nature recovery grant from government uh, to test whether we can establish a to reinvest the revenues right that will be generated from the projects to uh, to, um, to develop a, a revolving fund if you like to to reinvest in nature recovery at a landscape scale um, and then lastly in the solar nutrient market we're working with defra the government department and its regulators to test again um, whether through a, 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 in this case a, a, a nutrient market um, we can um, accelerate um, uh, solutions for both housing developers and um, and, and regulators in in um, delivering uh, nutrient um, uh, neutrality in in that catchment so some real world case studies, which I'm happy to pick up on in um, the discussion in QA, q and If I can just conclude then with my um, final slide, I, I just want to come back to where I started really, just reflecting on the fact that in the, in the light of the cost of living crisis, there is that need to rebuild trust and strengthen the partnership between regulated utilities and the public. Um, and um, the complexity of the current regulatory landscape and the prescriptive focus on process is really hampering the water industry's ability to innovate, certainly in the UK context. I've looked at that across the globe and, and in other contexts, whether privately or publicly owned, water businesses have rightly been focused on efficient invest investment and service delivery in their core business. And I think across the globe, water utilities are now at a fork in the road. One road is to simply continue to be efficient in infrastructure service providers, simult simultaneously constrained and protected as natural monopolies by their regulator. But the other is the one that I think we want to explore in this debate to, this morning, which is to allow water utilities to leverage their assets, their relationships and their reputations to identify and deliver a far wider range of services that are valued by customers and communities, effectively social purpose businesses that deliver public value, delivering just and fair outcomes uh, for their communities. 
Um, we're, ex we're innovating at Wessex Water with catchment markets as a case in point whilst, whilst evolving our social purpose and working with regulators to uh, make the case for the regulatory changes that could incentivize and accelerate that journey to become that social purpose business. Um, so I commend that to you and look forward to hearing um, uh, some of the other examples during the course of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. I'm Thank you, Guy, for that really insightful presentation um, on that kind of innovative topic of catchment markets. I'm now going to hand over to Brooke Atwell. Brooke is an associate director in Resilient Watersheds at the, at the Nature Conservancy, um, and Brooke is going to talk um, about the partnership perspective. Thank you, Brooke. All right, so today I'm going to be talking to you about how you might leverage diverse partnerships to create sort of multiple sources of value so you can invest in a very holistic watershed investment program. I'm going to go through a couple of very quick tables that kind of sets the stakeholder engagement setting, and then I'll move into two case studies, one around traditional restoration, which a lot of us see in the catchment story work, but one also about protection. So you're kind of generating sources of value via multiple vehicles. So these are the typical stakeholder types that we see in watershed investment programs and sort of the role that they might play in developing a cohesive uh, catchment management program where you're investing in nature-based solutions and also in gray infrastructure. I want to say take these with a little bit of a grain of salt because these are all rules of thumb, but of course they can change depending on the local context where you're in. Once you kind of figure out where your stakeholders will engage with you in the process, it's important to understand what sorts of water security challenges they might be interested in or concerned about and the NBS that can support that. Because importantly, those NBS that you will choose, depending on the ones that you choose, will basically tell you whether or not you have a high probability for multiple co-benefits you could monetize throughout the process. These are sort of the typical beneficiary benefit linkages and funding relationships to the watershed investment programs. So this is if you're gonna pool multiple sources of capital or stack them depending on the types of green and gray infrastructure that you might invest. This is how folks might engage within that context. All right, I'm gonna to move to Cape Town, which is gonna be our first case study. So Cape Town, as you all know, went through a massive drought, the three-year drought, which unfortunately is probably now the standard of living in Cape Town. Um, the catchment looks like the picture on the left here, you can see lots of trees, but it should look like the catchment on the right there. It's a native finbos habitat that is local to the region and you can't find it anywhere else in the world. So the Nature Conservancy works with a lot of partners, including the, thank you. Thank you. Uh, works with a lot of partners in the basin, including the government of Cape Town who manages the water supply to cut down trees. I know that that sounds very weird for a nature organization to be cutting down trees, but these trees that you see here are invasive pines and they're also very thirsty trees. So clearing the catchment of invasives would actually release the equivalent of about three months of water supply for the city of Cape Town, which in the state that it's in with drought management now is every little bit counts. So when the city was trying to figure out what are sort of our options to mitigate this drought and the effects that we're feeling, we looked at all of the areas where they might potentially invest, and that included both green and gray infrastructure. I think the thing that really kept us in the running here was that the city of Cape Town had already had experience with removing invasives, and so they understood kind of from the get-go what that potential could be. We basically looked at the costs and the benefits associated with each of these and the removal of IAP invasive alien plants in seven priority subcatchments would provide the greatest yield of water return with essentially the least amount of money. Now, Cape Town will have to invest in many of these options, so it will be over time a green-gray investment, but they wanted the Nature Conservancy and partners to kind of take over invasive species removal and convene a bunch of the partners who were already working across the basin. And so when we were trying to figure out what was the best option for investing, we looked at, again, what the stakeholders really cared about and where we might be able to maximize 
those sources of value. Specifically, what was interesting about this is around the poverty alleviation bucket here. It's not necessarily really interesting to the city of Cape Town, which manages the utility, but it is interested, interesting to the larger government programs who care about social development. The, cap, the catchment management program in Cape Town would create jobs specifically for women to enter the fields of invasive species removal. And they offered a mentorship program for these women to get involved and eventually set up and apply for a tender to, to manage invasive species on their own with their own company. And that was quite appealing to the city of Cape Town. All right, I'm gonna talk about Sebago Lake in Maine. We're gonna fly across the pond and go the other direction. This is a very typical kind of protection story. So Sebago Lake in Maine is very pristine. It provides the water source for Portland, Maine and the surrounding areas. And there's a lot of uh, companies in there, particularly breweries, who very much rely on that water for their source of business. It's also home to incredible megafauna and the only lake in the U.S. that has landlocked salmon, which is pretty cool. Okay, so as you can see, this is a map of the basin. It's super green. It's very forested. It's very pristine. 84% of the watershed is actually forested today. And the Portland Water District has federal filtration exemption because the water flowing into Sebago Lake is so clean. That's why they are sustainable. And they actually kind of pull up and capture uh, land. They acquire it when it comes on the market. But unfortunately, with the cost of development rising, Portland's growing, it's no longer feasible for them as a sole utility to buy up that land. So they sort of developed a partnership among multiple organizations who work in that basin to buy up and acquire land and kind of structure these smaller parcels, which are owned by individuals like us, and kind of package them into big deals that we can fundraise against and kind of acquire in one large lump sum. Importantly for Portland, a 10% reduction in forest would actually drop the entire basin below state water quality standards and the Portland Water District would no longer be able to supply water to the city of Portland. So this is a relatively urgent issue for the area, though it is pristine right now. So when we talk about ecosystem services that they use to kind of pull things together, they looked at everything from fiber and fuel. This is a big kind of uh, forestry production area as well. And they wanted to make sure that if they acquire land, if the landowner wants to make sure that that fiber and the fuel can still be produced, they kind of include that as a provision in the acquisition. They also looked at, you know, air quality maintenance, kind of erosion control and sedimentation. There's a ton of recreational value in this basin. I mean, they hold huge bass fishery competitions there every year. The lake itself has incredible fisheries. There's lots of hiking and mountain biking, and this is a very big tourism draw for the city of Portland, and it represents a large part of their economy. And then it also talked about provisioning of habitat. So, of course, you saw that moose up there. You want to keep them around. This is kind of the reason why people come to and visit the area. And so they looked at kind of pulling all of these pieces together, and they've now figured out that they need a $23 million investment for the primary portion of the basin. And that's what they're working towards in sort of trying to figure out if they enter the carbon market, maybe they might explore lead certification as a way for businesses to invest um, and get those credits in protection of the basin. So I will leave it at that. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. It was really fantastic to have some real life case studies um, to hear about uh, across the world, going from South Africa to the US. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Joe Shuttleworth. Um, Joe Shuttleworth is our global digital water skills lead, uh, and he's going to be talking about this in a project um, context. Thanks, Joe. Perfect. Hi everyone. So I'm oh my gosh. The, uh, so as, as Louise said, my name is Joe Shuttleworth. So I work in Arab's water business. Uh, I also have a role looking after digital water skills within Arab, and that really looks at how we can use digital and sort of data-driven approaches across all of our projects. And um, the so yeah, and today I'm going to talk to you about delivering or realizing the value of water on a on a project basis. And so effectively, how can we take uh, this sort of multifunctional uh, green blue infrastructure as part of a, a, a flood resilience project and actually deliver that through the various sort of cost benefit analysis process, but also technical assessment 
uh, to make, make it integrated as part of a wider project. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scene setting, but then I'm going to talk about a case study uh, that we've worked on uh, in a town called Mansfield um, with Seven Trent, who are a water company in the UK. And um, so but for, first things first, so, you know, what value can water infrastructure bring to urban spaces? And really what we're talking here about is multifunctional green, blue um, flooding infrastructure. So things like rain gardens, uh, permeable paving, uh, little pocket parks, you know, th things like that. Uh, and we're talking about it in an urban context. And uh, so just to set where we are. So first things first, so, you know, green, blue infrastructure uh, uh, to the environment by either treating surface water as it runs off and it has sort of microplastics, but also sort of, you know, organic material from, uh, from uh, uh, car emissions, things like that. They can also create better microclimates, cooling and shade, which is something uh, that people don't necessarily from a UK context think about when we're thinking about green blue infrastructure in cities. But as we're as, as we experienced an extremely hot summer, you know, we've had about eight weeks in London where it feels like it's been 40 degrees every single day, which is completely unheard of. But actually, how can these green spaces cool, cool, cool the environment around us and create, create, create more accessible sort of, you know, nicer spaces to be in? They also, you know, can be part of a sort of multifunctional, you know, infrastructure approach to cities. So how can they create a space that people can access in a city? If you don't have a garden, you can come and access a green space that can also double up as sort of water storage potentially. And finally, but most importantly, not obviously not most importantly, the, uh, 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 they, they can soak up surface water, uh, you know, act like a sponge to reduce flooding within cities. So what blockers are they are there to delivering value through water infrastructure? And um, if you think about a green blue scheme, they, they, they have they have lots of characteristics. They have four characteristics, well, they have four physical characteristics that, that, that can bring this out. They're distributed throughout the landscape. So that means you're not looking at sort of a central storage device, but you're looking at actually you know, a number of devices distributed throughout a city or a town that act as a system uh, to reduce flooding. Uh, you know, cool, cool, cooler space, provide, provide a network of spaces for people to access. They take different spatial scales. So when we're talking about green blue, green blue infrastructure, you might be looking at a rain butt on a, on a house, but you might also be looking at a landscape scale intervention of a, of a wetland or a new, 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 new woodland. They're locally specific. You know, no, 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 no two rain gardens uh, that collect water uh, are the same. You know, their, their, their specific design is governed by the local context in terms of the topography, the existing utilities and things like that. And they're also functionally specific. So a rain garden that is, you know, is, is reducing flooding, but also increasing biodiversity might be different to one that is about creating a new space, you know, a new space for someone to access that might be integrated with, you know, electronic charging or something like that. And another another point to, to 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 bring out here is that there's uncertainty associated with the behavior and sort of performance of a natural system, and obviously that that that's what you would expect. But it means that it can add to the complexity along with those other four factors that can make them more more difficult to deliver or build the business case compared to a pure grey infrastructure scheme. So, Mansfield. Uh, I'm going to talk about a case study now about delivering green blue infrastructure at scale and um, it has a UK context um, and some of it goes into the, 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 the weeds a little bit on the on the details, because actually when we're talking about you know green blue infrastructure what we're really talking about probably in reality is green blue plus grey infrastructure, you know a mixture of, of, of all types of infrastructure types. But we're also talking about what are the sort of economic decisions, you know, technical information that needs to go into something that can be robust enough to form part of a business case and be funded by a water company or go through go go through regulation. So some of the details are not, not they're not they're not boring, but they are very quite quite specific. So Mansfield, um, Mansfield is is a is a town in the UK in Nottinghamshire, uh, sort of in between Nottingham and and Sheffield, if you if you know where that is. A third of the population is at risk of flooding. So one in three households are at risk of flooding. I've assumed that scales up to a third of the population. I don't know where they all live. Um, but it's also one of it's also the 36th most deprived area in the UK. Uh, and there are thousands of, 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 of these local areas in the UK. So it puts it at the sort of, you know, at, 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 at the bottom of that ranking. 
So in July 2020, um, DEFRA and the water regulator Ofwat in the UK asked Seven Trent, who are the local water company, uh, to consider how they could contribute to support the green recovery. So 2020 was during during COVID by create by driving the bolder environmental decision uh, or environmental action within in in Mansfield. You know, creating jobs whilst also stimulating the economy whilst also reducing reducing flood risk. So we work with them uh, to help deliver the business case that was submitted to, to, to this green recovery fund and our, and, and our, robust needed, our approach needed to have three uh, characteristics. It needed to be technically and, and, and economically robust. So it needs to be able to go through a sort of formal business case uh, review, uh, provide you know, robust economic benefits, but also provide the technical assurance that it is gonna reduce flood risk in, in, in the area. To do that, it needs to properly value the benefits of green blue infrastructure. You know where you're putting in these, uh, and we talk a bit about this, a bit about this later. When you're putting in these interventions, actually you're putting in a, a multifunctional piece of infrastructure. You know something that's looking at flood risk, but also biodiversity, but also urban cooling, but also amenity, and needs to properly value those benefits in a, in a robust way. And it also needs to make the best use of. Um, uh, digital and sort of digital technologies to enable data processing at, 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 at a citywide scale and comparison across different locations. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about, um, about our approach and I'll sort of rifle through, through, through these slides. So the first thing we wanted to do is actually try and categorize the different land uses within, 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 within Mansfield into, into different, different typologies. So we identified a number from industrial to allotment gardens to mobile homes to major parks. Uh, and this is describing within a certain sort of geographical or spatial scale, you know, what the land use is within, within that area. So we did that because for our next step, we use um, satellite imagery uh, and some machine learning algorithms to classify the land, the, the land use within Mansfield into certain, certain types, which allowed us to make decisions as we moved forward. To do this, this if, if it was done as a manual task, this might take someone sort of, you know, it could it could take you, you know, if you're reviewing mapping data, sort of uh, land use data, it could take you hundreds or sort of thousands of hours. <laughs> By using satellite data and machine learning algorithms, it could be done in sort of minutes or or seconds, and it gives you that baseline from which to sort of start to drive more decisions. So from this, you can see it's a mixture of sort of green space, but also there is this sort of um, you know, the Victorian, the, the residential and other sort of industrial land uses and allows us to do that. The next thing we did is to identify for those identified typologies, what um, blue green interventions are applicable. So we looked at uh, detention basins, uh, planted bias whales, you know, down to street planters, verge rain, verge rain gardens. And we made an assessment with, 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 with Seven Trent and other collaborators about the suitability of those different typologies for those specific types of, in, of interventions. Based on that, we took what were standard uh, versions of those typologies. So we looked at a sort of 30 by 30 meter grid, and we assessed in the first case, the storage potential in, e in each of those areas. Uh, and we did that by taking some sort of exemplar examples. And our engineering team uh, looked at, uh, at an image and they looked at things like the road width. They looked at the location of cars. Uh, they looked at you know, green space next to pavements, and they effectively designed some, some trial schemes which started to build, provide the evidence base for storage in meters cubed per hectare in each area. Um, and you can see that, that, that it varies from sort of you know, zero in some areas uh, through to industry. And that's a factor of the type of interventions we were considering, but also the local, the, the local context. And there is an element of this in here where it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not you know, factual. It, some of it's a rule of thumb or sort of you know, engineering, engineering judgment. So the next thing we want to do is now we know, or now we have an idea of the, the, the flood storage potential, what's the benefit in terms of the, the, the wider benefits? So this is drawing on the same sort of benefit mapping activity that Louise uh, presented in, in, in her opening statements. But for each green blue intervention, it, we, we identified a number of benefits from you know, air quality through to flooding, through to, uh, water, well, flooding isn't there, through to water quality, pump, reduced pumping, carbon sequestration. We looked at the impact pathways, so how they create a benefit, the beneficiaries that are receiving that, and we also map that against the capitals. In the UK, the six, sort of six capitals approach is quite commonly used with our, with, with our water regulators, but those same benefits can be uh, mapped across different sort of uh, wide, wide, wider metrics, as, as Louise touched on before as well. So 
it's, it's very nice to have an idea of what types of things you might be benefiting, but in order to be part of a sort of robust economic decision making, this needs to be quantified. So for each of these, each of these benefits, uh, we looked at what value that was and the methods of calculation. Uh, it's based on some, uh, it's, it's not internally Arab generated sort of valuation tools. Within the UK, there are, there are, there, there's a, a tool, the Syria BEST tool, uh, which stands for Benefit uh, Estimation Tool. Um, and, it, and it's a way of calculating different benefits. And um, the other thing we did is for each, um, uh, each, each scenario, we, we, we made some engineering assessments about the effectiveness of, 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 of the blue-green infrastructure. So we had varying levels of that. And that related to the sort of the, 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 the amount of gray infrastructure that will be included in this solution as well. So that's a number of different scenarios. This, this allowed us to do a cost benefit. So we looked at the overall sort of life, life term cost of, 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 of these schemes across Mansfield and looked at the capital cost, but also the operational cost of, 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 of owning and main, main, maintaining these sort of these green infrastructure schemes. And we could compare this against uh, the benefits that, that we calculated through the um, there through, through our benefit uh, um, assessment process. What you can see is that some of the uh, solutions where you have blue green infrastructure, uh, you know, they are more, more expensive in terms of you know, the upfront or the upfront sort of ongoing costs. You know, this is partially because you're looking at sort of distributed costs of, of doing infrastructure across a wider range of area. You also have much more sort of, you, or you have potentially more sort of maintenance costs that get integrated into it as well. But when you look at the net cost, uh, which is the sort of, you know, the, the cost minus the, the benefit, actually the, 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 the schemes that are showing more benefit have, you know, blue, green or sort of mixture of blue, green, gray infrastructure integrated into them. So what's the outcome? Uh, so the project received um, 76 million in, in funding through the green recovery scheme. And it's one of the largest scale implementations of blue, green infrastructure in, 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 in the UK. Um, planning's underway uh, for construction and delivery, uh, being led by Seven Trent, uh, you know, our, our, our partners, and, um, and we're happy to still be involved. Um, so hopefully that was interesting. Um, sorry about the graphs, uh, but yeah, I'm going to hand back over to Louise now. Thank you, Joe. Uh, really, really interesting. Again, a really interesting um, example of implementation um, of that kind of total value framework. I'm now going to hand over to Bart, um, who's an Associate Director in Water Advisory at Arup, but previously um, was the Director of Governance, Public Value and the Environment at Ofwat, which is the UK water regulator. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, so yes, uh, I can give you a regular perspective because I used to be a regulator until very, very recently, uh, including actually when this Mansfield scheme came through the regulatory uh, processes. Uh, and I'll come back to that because there's a, another point that Joe didn't touch on, but it was a co-funded scheme. So 89% of those costs are recovered through customers, not 100%. And so this is really quite relevant and important from a regulatory perspective and from a regulator's perspective. Um, so, but just taking a step back and, and also, you know, so Guy from Wessex, uh, I think uh, some of the messages will be very similar. Guy and I, I think, are in a violent agreement, but just I want to flip it on its head for a second uh, versus the context that Guy set out to start with, which is, so we in the UK right now, we've had the hottest temperature on record ever, 42 degrees, it actually was, and it felt like that, extended periods of no rain. Uh, the, the, the country is officially a significant majority significantly uh, in drought, and that's on the back of the hot, of the driest, one of the driest winters ever. So this is a really challenging context. Now, despite that context, nobody in the UK lost access to clean, safe, reliable drinking water at affordable costs and at stable costs. Nobody. And that's in contrast to absolutely skyrocketing energy prices, which is absolutely terrifying people. There have been some host pipe bans by a few companies, which means that, you know, you need to water your garden with a bucket rather than with a host pipe. But really, this fundamental right has been preserved in the country, unlike in many parts of the world. That's quite amazing. So you might think that people are really, really grateful about this and really happy with this. And, and, and you know, <laughs> you might think that, you know, the media is full of praise uh, over this and, and people are eight o'clock in the evening clapping in the streets, thanking, thanking the water sector. So, so that's not the case. 
uh, somehow, which you might know, and Guy alluded to, and, and if you open any newspaper, you might have seen. So these are some of the headlines from the last few weeks, and I've picked out, you know, the easygoing ones, frankly. And so, you know, I'll just point this one out. Utilities, this is about the water sector, by the way. Utilities and records are not fit for purpose, says this is uh, Dieter Helm, pretty influential man. He says, you know, the system is not working. And so you kind of go, okay, well, that's paradoxical because uh, some of it's clearly working very well. So why is that? And there's a number of reasons, but two of them are alluded to here. One is what Guy was alluding to, which is actually at the end of the pipes, what's coming out of storm overflow specifically into rivers and oceans uh, is, is not good. It's too frequent. It's impacting the system and it's an issue. It's not acceptable and it needs to be fixed. So it's, it's, I'm not saying it's not an issue, it's a major issue. The other one is flooding. So when it does rain these days, it pours. So in the middle of this extended spell in London, there was a few days of absolute downpour. And so parts of North London, very close to where I live, started flooding in the middle of this heat wave and people's basements started flooding and houses flooding and streets were flooding in the middle of this. And so the water companies get blamed. Now, they're not responsible for this system. They're part of it, but they're certainly not responsible for the flood management system. Yet the fingers still point at them. So it's pretty complex. So the question then becomes, how did we get here? How are we in this paradoxical situation? And now there's a lot of debate about this, and it's very political, and it's about nationalization and renationalization and private evil companies. And so it's hard to cut through that. But one way of looking at this is basically, which kind of cuts through all of it and makes it depoliticize it, is that the way we valued water in the past and in the recent past basically is crashing into the expectations and the challenges of the present. It's kind of that simple, but also that complex. And that's where we are at. So in a kind of very simplified way, what we used to value is service provision, right? Give me clean drinking water and take it away from my house, the bits that are left over from it. Please, please do that. Okay, yeah, so we will. And so we did, fantastic results. But that's not good enough anymore in this context. It really isn't. You need to start looking at the environmental impacts and your environmental contributions. And you need to start looking at your social impact above and beyond health, which is huge. But what more can you do? And so the value of water goes up as you do that. And actually, the value of water utility contributions goes up as you do that. And so what's happening, and this is what Guy was saying in a, in a, in a different way, but actually, we're moving from this to this. Either we are or we should be. And it's no longer a public service by a service utility. It's an environmental business with a social purpose that provides you with water and wastewater services, right? It's not no longer about the sector, it's about society and the planet. It is no longer about outputs that you deliver, it's about what are the wider outcomes we need to achieve, least cost to best value. What Guy was saying, and everybody's been demonstrating, great in and of itself, forget it. The solutions of, the, of, of yesterday are the problems of today. So we need green, we need blue, we need behavioral changes. And it's no longer about a utility with its supply chain, it's about partnering. And so the role is changing, people expect different things. But from a regulator, I don't think people really appreciate this. You are regulating very different entities, in essence. A lot of the core is the same, but the role is different. And as a regulator, you, know, you need to evolve, you need to adapt. You need to promote, ideally lead. I don't think that's always the case, but you know, so, but this is a really very different scenario. Now, just to finish off, um, changes are happening, right? So a lot of, a lot of, we've come a long way uh, in the regulation with the, the, you know, the likes of Guy, first speaker, really eminent, you know, leading thinker globally in this space, also really pushing government and the regulators to, to evolve. But, you know, change, change has happened. It's a way to go. But so the environment agency in, in, in asking in companies to plan for the future and resources and drainage, really they're looking for things like biodiversity impacts, natural capital, environmental improvements. These wider benefits are coming in. Similarly, the economic regulator, Ofwat, I mean, you can't read this, but these are the public value principles, asking for companies to deliver greater environmental and social value uh, beyond the statutory requirements. It's part of the big next kind of price review cycle, deliver greater social value. So these, these, this push, this, this kind of 
this leading or following, you know, depending, is happening and is trying to accommodate it, facilitate it, enable it. But it doesn't mean that we're there. It doesn't mean that we're dumb. It doesn't mean that we haven't got further to go. And there will always, there will always be tensions and questions within that. Things like, and Louise was pointing out to mention this, rightly so, is what really is the remit of a water utility? How far should they really go? especially on the social side and what should customers really be paying for and no no customer is the same as the next customer some might care some might not so th this conceptual question of the role of a company is actually a really complex one and the board of a, of a regulator will, will quite get quite nervous about this really is that is that for the companies or is that for government right so kind of thing costs and co-funding and this is and so if it if it's cheaper that's great if it's cost neutral kind of great if it's more expensive but better, better, more benefits, that's, that's really great. But actually, if other people are also benefiting from this, like a local council, because people can go walking, or an insurance company, because that basement is not flooding anymore, then surely if they're benefiting, it shouldn't just be the water utilities customers paying. And that's why Mansfield, Mansfield is a really powerful example getting through these processes. That's why Mansfield is situated on this. 89% is being paid by customers, 11% isn't, because the benefits are accruing to others as well. And then the risk point, which is a very simple word for a very complex context, and Guy was alluding to it, it's also, you know, some of these traditional solutions are, people know they work. That doesn't mean they'll work over time, because they will never be big enough. It doesn't mean they're cheap, they're bad for the environment, but they, they know they'll work, and they'll work quickly. And so if there's real pressure to, do, to, to resolve something in the face of stakeholder pressure, you might lean that way. Or you might just be conservative and think, actually, you know, even over time, the risk is lower with this. So there will always be tensions and trade-offs um, within the system, but it certainly has evolved. So, so just to finish, I mean, you know, clearly we have major issues, but the frameworks are evolving and, and we're trying to sort them out. If you're in a context where maybe regulation is either not present or starting or less mature, clearly you want to focus on drinking water first and foremost. That's absolutely, absolutely key. But bringing these other benefit areas is other areas of value think about those as well uh, to the extent that you can because otherwise in 10 15 years you might be in the place where we are where we're, you're doing a great job on one thing but you're getting absolutely hammered for another so okay thank you Thank you very much, Mark, for providing that regulatory perspective. I'm now going to hand over um, to Mark Fletcher, who's our global water business leader at Arup, who's going to moderate the panel discussion. Um, is it possible to bring Guy back up on screen? Thank you. Uh, we're using the microphone so that people online can follow our discussions. What's really great about Stockholm now is we're hybrid, so we're accessing lots of people externally, and I think that's really powerful. Um, I've been coming to Stockholm for 10 years and I've, I've been in the water sector for 35 years. And I think we're really at a sort of pivotal place and the presentations I've just seen is it, pretty wow. And I think there's change. And um, what we're really interested in is, okay, so what are your questions, thoughts, comments or challenges having just seen what we've had presented? And we've had presented from different perspectives. And all of you engage with the water cycle in different ways, in unique ways. So you'll all have different perspectives. So I wonder who wants to start us off. Having, I, I'm sure it feels quite intimidating, but it put a lot of effort in to try and convey the full sort of panoply of what's of, of, of latest thinking on value. And it's really important that we. Uh, use this opportunity for you to engage, express your views, and see if we can get some interaction going. So who'd like to start us off? Lovely. Now, the way this is going to work is, this is the sort of magic microphone that engages our hybrid audience. So this, uh, this microphone will go to whoever's speaking. If you could just say who you are and what your organization is, and then uh, direct your question to which member of the panel you'd like. I'll then, um, uh, and then that, that member of the, of the panel will then respond. So if you'd like to go first, thank you. 
Thank you so much and really interesting. My name is Jenny Barr and I am a professor in ag water at uh, the university, but have lived very much in the UK. And I watch what you're doing now post Brexit and out of the EU water framework directive. It's super, super interesting to see. Uh, but also, uh, I, you know, I have two, two questions. I have lots of questions, two questions. One was to the second speaker saying they were moving from a results or output framework to outcome framework. Framework. And my question is like the water framework directive has been in place for 20 years, which is a results framework, but you're reporting modeling. You're not reporting absolute measurements from the water. And, and my question is, what makes you think that the fussy out, outcomes will be a better way to see that we progress towards those things and multiple things we want to achieve? Um, yeah, and the second question was uh, here towards the end, and and I wanted to ask very specifically because, okay, uh, the the upfront investments you say or tend to be a little bit higher, uh, even three times higher, I think, or two twice maybe, and um, if you have public procurement, um, is is those rules a problem because they tend to opt for the cheapest upfront cost solution? And do you want to, do you see that eventually actually these upfront costs will be uh, something that is pushed on to the uh, clients or consumers or the ones who actually want to have fresh water in their pipes? Great start. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, right. <laughs> I, think, I, I think presenter number two is Guy. If, oh, yeah. if, Louise, if Louise with the introduction. So Guy, did you pick up on that? The, it's really this sort of outputs to outcomes. I think it's a really good question. Do you, do you want to uh, give, give us your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, 100%. So um, we're, we're viewing Brexit as an opportunity, right? I mean, it's happened. So there is that opportunity then to evolve um, our own regulatory framework in the UK um, to drive the environmental improvement um, uh, that we want to see. Um, and it will fundamentally rest on a pivot from a regime which is um, which it, it, which is uh, prescriptive and and process led to one which will require us to um, build new capabilities in monitoring and um, uh, a, 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 and measuring the outcomes over time. So I mean it will rest for me, on the framework of, uh, uh, of of standards that we need to build, so that we understand better, um, you know, using best available science, you know, what we are trying to uh, achieve and, and what interventions will deliver um, what results. Um, and, and over time, that regulators and uh, and all players in a catchment um, can collaborate better around. Um, uh, frameworks of, of, of uh, uh, modern, modern frameworks to, 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 to monitor and generate um, better data and information so that we can evolve those standards as science, um, as, as science emerges. My contention is whilst there's a huge amount of uncertainty, as I think Joe touched on in respect of, for example, the, um, the role of um, inherently more um, complex um, uh, ecosystem uh, based interventions um, that they will inevitably deliver uh, more holistic improvements and therefore uh, it is it, 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 it's about the um, uh, it, it's about moving effectively from um, uh, you know, the, the, the standard uh, kind of ex post model of regulation to one which is kind of a, a, an ex ante model of regulation which enables us to yeah, move the dial on the on the investment and, and adjust uh, standards and approaches as the science evolves. From a water utility yeah. perspective, sorry, just just reflecting on the water framework directive. Finally, I guess going back to my point about the um, the opportunity to translate long term environmental improvement targets into catchment based outcomes, the water framework directive at the moment has the perverse effect of um, it, 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 um, raising un, uh, undeliverable expectations, I guess, on the part of the water for, on, on the part of water utility. So, yeah, we are we're, we're, we're making the case to the regulator that um, we need to break those um, th those long term targets down into uh, outcomes that are controllable and measurable by the water company. So, for example, from a perspective of 
um, the, 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 from the Wessex Water's perspective in our catchments, very significantly um, affected by diffuse water pollution from um, nitrates and phosphorus. Um, there's a really significant opportunity for us to play a leading role in removing those uh, nutrients and delivering um, outcome-based targets to in, improve, uh, significantly improve uh, the quality of, the, of our river catchments. What we can't achieve is um, the removal of um, some of the um, uh, chemicals affecting the, um, the ability to achieve uh, 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 good, uh, good environmental uh, status. Um, so focusing on the, on the um, outcomes that are controllable by the water utility, incentivizing the water utility and building frameworks um, that enable us to monitor and understand better whether we are, <laughs> whether we are delivering those outcomes is going to be key. Thanks very much for that. It's, it's interesting, I reflect when I was at university, the river in Leeds was biologically dead, the river air. And now when I fish it, there are kingfishers and there are salmon returning. That's what I see as an outcome. And I think it's whether our process is looking towards achieving those really strong outcomes that benefit everybody, which is really fundamental. I wonder on that, it's a really good point as well, this sort of higher capex perspective and this broader total value framework. I wonder who, who would like to, maybe maybe Louise. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I presented a fairly extreme example where there was double the capex and I think five times the benefits. Um, uh, and I, I think, you know, even in that instance, um, you may find it difficult to get that through uh, uh, the kind of investment decision gateways, but I probably have kind of four areas where I think we we need to do further work. Essentially, um, the first is uh, I, I think we may not see all green and or all it may not be as kind of polarizing as all green and all grey solutions. I think we're going to very much end up in the place where we're um, uh, looking at hybrid um, solutions. Um, with the green getting you part of the way there uh, uh, to reduce your OPEX costs and, and potentially reduce some of the, you know, uh, uh, a massive capital out outlay um, around some of the things like um, phosphorus removal, uh, and then just using some of the grey solutions to kind of tick you to that regulatory level. Um, I think there's work to be done on how low we can get some of these nature-based solutions costs um, at the moment. Um, as kind of Joe mentioned, they're very location and context specific, and there will always be an element of that. But there are some great examples. Um, I used to work in New York um, on the New York DEP um, green infrastructure rollout, and there they managed a, a very um, efficient way of kind of standardizing stormwater planter design, uh, which allowed them to roll it out kind of in a very efficient and, and relatively quick way. And I think we need to start to look at how we do some of those things, pulling in some of the digital tools. And the other element is the who benefits, who pays piece. Um, so in that example that I gave, I think you'd question whether the water customer should provide all of the funding um, or whether there should be a you know contribution um, from uh, places like potentially, and, and these are uh, areas I think that need further exploration, but around kind of health, um, uh, nature, uh, NGOs, local authorities, um, all of whom have a vested interest in there being kind of more green space. Um, and finally, I, I guess I'd point to the public value principles that the regulator in the UK has at the moment and, um, and, and probably link to my first point around, you may not see a scheme like that get through. Um, and I think the public value principle is that um, you can support a scheme like that where you can demonstrate customers support for it and customers willingness to pay for it. Um, so that local kind of engagement is very much kind of required to ascertain whether customers are willing to pay that extra um, in order to get um, the additional kind of immunity benefit. Yes, we'll just, we'll just get a, an additional contribution from Bart. I'm not giving him a choice. Um, so just on your first point, two quick things. One is, I don't think outcomes are fuzzy. Uh, if they are fuzzy, then someone's not doing something right. So I don't think you should go by concrete versus fuzzy. I think that's quite right. Um, secondly, one of the biggest problems we're facing is basic systems theory thinking, right? Which is that if you sub, if you optimize a part of the system, it doesn't mean you optimize the system. On the contrary, you might make it worse. And and this and talking about money, right? So the outcome is the river quality, say river health, or 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 the ability to go swimming. Um, 
multiple contributions to that. It may be that one part is actually a relatively small contribution to that, but a disproportion of the attention and a disproportionate amount of the money of which there isn't enough to go around is going into that part of it. And so you're really making one bit better, but you still can't go swimming. And that's what an outcomes way of looking at the world also means is that you really look at what's contributing to what ultimately matters, rather than then than suboptimally optimizing all the individual components. And, and that's really, really important, because we're faced with that problem uh, every day. Uh, 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 thanks very much. It's interesting, water, water's a system. So I'm going to give you an opportunity Oh, is, is it, is, okay. No, it's interesting. Water's a, a system. It's not a sector or it's not a, a piece of a pie. And because it's a system, it interacts with other systems. And there's lots of dependencies and interdependencies. I think the really interesting thing, and, and it came through quite a lot in the presentations, but maybe across them, is the importance of governance. And that is the various organizations working across the water cycle starting to work better together with a lot more common purpose around these solutions. So I think they were fantastic questions to get us going. And you can talk about the fuzziness afterwards uh, outside. So I'm going to take a question over here and then a question over there, if that's OK. Again, could you just tell us sort of who you are in your organization and who you want to direct your question to? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Abdi Wario. I work with Gatsby. Africa, which is based in Kenya. My question is directed to but in many jurisdictions, you realize that the functions of water utility is defined and confined to water and sanitation service provision. How do you incentivize utilities to look beyond their mandated functions to get into space such as green blue initiatives? That's a great. That's a great question, and Bart is very well positioned to give us a view. Anyway, I thought I'd answered it. Um, so, so um, I, I will. I will answer. I just want to say one thing. Actually, that thinking about the remit of the water utility is really quite important. And so, just to point out what's happening in New Zealand, for example, under this thing called the three water reforms, they are. First of all, consolidating an enormous amount of little utilities into four big entities to cover the country, but they're bringing stormwater into the remit of these of these utilities. So it's water, wastewater, and stormwater. And you know, I think that is an incredibly smart move uh, because one of the things that we're faced with in the UK is that the fragmentation of the of the flooding system is is um, hindering the ability to deal with it. So just to note on. My point there is you can think about what the remit should be in the first place. Um, should it be broader than water and wastewater? On your on your second question, I mean, the, everything that's been said in a way generally does answer it. So you need to, um, I think everybody knows is increasingly uh, of the view that nature-based solutions um, are uh, the, way, the way to go. Then the question is, how do you really bring them into uh, getting through the, the regulatory process. And it is things like the evidence base, the, the solid evidence base that they, they will deliver what they need to deliver. That's really key. And this is everything that Louise has been talking about. Then there is the question around, um, uh, you know, getting the custom reviews and the people who are paying, showing that they support this as well, and they genu genuinely do. And then you can start getting into really more complex incentivization approaches whereby you kind of, you know, in essence, give more money if you do better than you said you were going to do, but perhaps penalize you if, if you don't. So you can get really into quite relatively complex incentivization mechanisms. Uh, and I would make the point that water companies have a role to play on that water cycle, but by no means are they the only player on the water cycle. <laughs> There's lots of other organizations. If ever you map the responsibilities of those organizations on the water cycle, there's quite a lot of overlaps. There's quite a lot of opportunity for people to work together, which means the responsibility doesn't always solely lie on the water company, but the public perception might be that the water company are the sole guardians of everything, particularly when things go wrong, which is quite important. Guy, I think, do you want to come in on this one, please? Yeah, I was just I was just going to reflect on that that journey. So, so when we looked at the concept of outcome based environmental regulation with frontier economics, 
the case we were making was for incentivizing the water sector differently to enable us to overcome the barriers that Barton, um, yourself, Mark, have just touched on there to investing in different alternatives to the traditional asset based solutions. So I think, you know, from a water utility perspective, it's it's going to be about moving the regulatory model from one that gives a return on built assets um, and therefore is significantly skewed towards capex investment um, towards a model that incentivizes uh, environmental and social value um, uh, in line with with the societal expectations. That's quite a big challenge for um, a regulatory system where we, in the moment, we have a, a, an economic regulator rightly focused on value for money for the customer. Um, and, and a quality regulator really struggling with the kind of complexity uh, of, of the challenge we now face in the midst of a, a climate and nature crisis. So, so, but there is an opportunity to, I think, with, a, with the water sector being heavily regulated and um, effectively um, relatively homogenous to test that model out. In the longer term, I touched on the role of markets and, and how markets can effectively um, uh, allocate um, capital more efficiently. Uh, and the answer we've come to in respect of the longer term opportunity to break down the what you've just touched on there, Mark, which is the kind of uh, the inherent unfairness, I guess, of the te tendency for the water utility to be targeted as the cash cow in a catchment. Um, and um, other sectors to continue to to pollute, not to play their part. There is an opportunity long term if we are to apply the polluters pays polluter pays principle properly, to evolve to a system of um, credits and permits that are made of increasingly scarce over time, um, to deliver the environmental improvements and to ensure that there's an equitable approach taken to each of the sectors in delivering that um, their, their their part. Now that will require um, very significant um, investment in a in regulatory framework which enables high integrity markets to deliver better environmental outcomes and in particular stronger focus on the role of regulators and government in, in uh, regulating and governing those markets and as I touched on earlier in a system of, of standards and accreditation capabilities um, to enable us to adjust um, approaches as, as the science evolves. Very very different type of approach to the sort of top-down model um, that we currently have. But the um, the contention we're making is that we can over time, certainly in the UK context, move to that blueprint for uh, driving environmental improvement and mobilizing private capital uh, behind the efficiencies that can be delivered through a market in environmental services. Yeah. And I think it's really important in the context of the discussion we're having here. This is, although we might it might feel a little UK centric around this or global north, a lot of the principles will apply to the global south and we've got to just think about the context in which you're working or operating and how you think these things might be affecting you in your context It'd be quite good to hear some perspectives but going over to my friend over here thank you uh, thank you my name is zane marshall i'm the director of water resources for the southern nevada water authority in las vegas and my question is to collaboration so there was some discussion about shared responsibility and risk and in las vegas we have been working in a collaborative process uh, for the past 22 years to address erosion and uh, stormwater management in the las vegas wash which is the primary drainage for the valley um, and there is there are overlapping responsibilities with the cities the water utilities and the wastewater agencies to uh, to comply with certain environmental permits and requirements. And through that collaboration, we have addressed erosion, we've um, implemented environmental restoration. And so I'm, I'm curious to the, what extent um, is this, this topic in the UK or other areas, uh, to what extent does it involve collaborations across UT, um, uh, jurisdictions um, and organizations? I, th I think that's a really, really great fundamental uh, uh, um, question there, Zane. Maybe, Louise, you'd like to take it first. If... Joe, that's your warning. <laughs> um, so absolutely. Um, I think particularly in the area of stormwater, um, we're seeing those collaborations. If, if I give um, two examples, so uh, uh, the first um, is, a, is a project called Greener Grangetown, which is in um, my wonderful hometown of Cardiff. Go visit it if you've never been. Um, uh, Grangetown was uh, an area of kind of Victorian housing, uh, houses opening onto directly onto pavements or sidewalks, um, a, a huge kind of grey space. 
um, it's an area where we had kind of stormwater challenges uh, and therefore pollution kind of entering into the um, river that runs through the center of Cardiff. Uh, on top of that, there were some kind of surface water flooding issues as well. Um, and the collaboration was formed between um, Natural Resources Wales, which is essentially the kind of environmental um, regulator and flood risk management authority, and Welsh Water, the water company, um, and Cardiff City Council, the local authority, with a kind of try kind of aim so the first being regeneration of an area um, that's relatively uh, central um, but experiences kind of uh, the challenges of kind of Victorian housing uh, the water company from a perspective of um, the overwhelming of the combined sewer network and the CSO spills um, and the flood management authority from the surface water perspective and the result is a kind of very nice green space um, where property values have gone up uh, and there's um, very nice kind of tree-lined streets uh, active transport um, network now through that location um, and I think you know those opportunities are fantastic. I'm not saying they're easy, um, and you've probably experienced that yourself. Um, it definitely takes um, a, a fair amount of kind of local knowledge um, and partnership building to get to those locations. But I think once you have it between organisations, there's the opportunity then to scale it um, more broadly. I'd agree with that. And there is this sense of common purpose, and you probably got it in Nevada, where you're all seeing what you, you well, maybe it's the challenge or the opportunity one can become another and i think it's really important that we get all also that all the relevant voices are heard and are part of the solution but maybe joe you could you've got something to add yeah i think i think it's a great um question and um, i think collaboration is key to delivering a lot of these projects or programs that move towards a sort of, you know, a, a transition towards a you know water, water infrastructure based around public value, but also around a sort of ecological transition to more sort of, you know, climate resilient sort of, you know, future looking infrastructure. And um, in the UK, there are lots of, and Louise touched on, on, on a couple of them. So Green and Grange Town, you know, um, there are projects um, funded through Offwire, actually they're very collaborative delivery projects um, that look at collaboration. I would say that a lot of them are driven by, um, though, the personal, um, you know, it might be individuals who are particularly proactive within organizations or within a local area who are interested in collaborating. The formal mechanisms for collaboration are probably more limited. And I think that's where um, the, um, the, the concept around potentially, you know, ar around markets sometimes. So how can uh, environmental services be delivered more, 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 more efficiently or sort of most efficiently. And I think there needs to be a, you know, a shift in sort of institutional infrastructure to enable or sort of incentivize collaboration, you know, between water companies, risk management authorities, local, local authorities, but also, you know, communities potentially. And, and a point I don't want to lose, which is really important, and sure we have sort of social equity and, and, and social justice, so that all uh, uh, interested parties are properly represented, and that uh, and that will in, in, include Indigenous interests as well, depending on your context. So I think I've got the next question here, and the and what will be I think the last question here because of time. Yeah. So uh, keep them concise if you can. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's it's a bit complex, but can you can you hear me? Okay. So. I guess my question is that you highlighted a lot the monetary value. And by the way, I'm Stefano WWF working in Southeast Asia. That's, that's very helpful as a decision matrix, but it tends to fail or to become very risky in a context uh, characterized by very deep uncertainty. When you're working on uh, green solutions uh, versus gray solutions, and I think that's the case over there in the UK, as well as in Southeast Asia, you are making very different decisions. While the gray solution is a point, like the green solution is almost a path over time. And as such as a path, you need to stick to that over time. And trade-offs, such as the monetary values, the technologies, as well as the politics, as well as the governance change considerably. What thoughts or advice or ideas would you have in terms of how to stick to this path over time? Thank you. Thank you. And as in the time that I passed the microphone over here, I can tell you in the approach to the master plan for Shanghai, which is blue, green, gray, it was about trade-offs and it isn't binary. 
So this is very much about seeing what works. And, and I think the, the role of governance in unlocking what works is really fundamental. But uh, whose hand was, um, I, I think we should have hands up rather than like, right? Uh, Brooke's not spoken yet, so let's give. Yeah. Sorry. Not at all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, you're right. MBS takes time to mature into its full functionality. And so it's important to have a set of early, early indicators, kind of medium and long-term where you can assess whether or not you're on the right track. And then you have a way to adaptively manage whether or, need, whether or not the model that you actually used to develop your NBS did produce the results that you actually want to see. And so you wanna use adaptive management then to change where maybe your investment might go depending on those early, medium and long-term indicators. Then when it comes to governance, so if you are doing sort of a partnership approach here, you really want to look at the legal regulatory framework in which you're developing it and then ensure that you get stakeholders who are critical to ensuring that all of the opinions diversity are included in that. And so when there is regulatory and legal change, the governance structure that you've created is sort of filling an interim gap and can adjust. You should really look at your board, your kind of advisory groups every two to three years and ensure that you guys are actually serving the purpose that you set out to do and adjust as the world changes because we're no longer in a status quo. Uh, thanks very much. In, in the true principle of hybrid working guy, I think you'd raise your hand very politely. Could you be quite concise because we're tight for time? That'd be yeah, really great. I'm, thanks. I'm conscious we need to bring Louise in for her closing reflections. So, I mean, just to summarise, um, I think there are two things that we need to be doing to evolve regulation to enable water utilities to deliver greater value and invest in the range of solutions that we've rehearsed this, uh, this morning. And, and first and foremost, it's about how government and regulators set clear guidance for companies. And, and, long, and, and against long-term outcome goals, translate those into specific, measurable, um, shorter-term targets, right? So that's the first part of it. Um, and, then, and then secondly, it's about involving the incentives. So incentives should form the basis of a modern compliance strategy for all sectors, not just for the water utility sector. So as we all grapple with the challenge of net zero and how we actually make a bigger contribution to nature recovery, we need to think about how we evolve price controls to reward more innovative, less certain approaches and think beyond short term price controls to invest in longer term solutions. So that that for me is it, is, is, is it in a nutshell, we have to work and co-create with regulators as utilities to test how, how that model can um, adapt, evolve and, and, and work. Oh, thanks, Guy. Now, Louise is about to give us a, a summary, but I did say you'd, I'm gonna give the, give the opportunity to ask the question, and I'll request that then people answer the question when the session finishes, so we, okay, okay. Hi, I'm actually one of the Global South questions. Uh, I'm in Liberia, West Africa, uh, last year, we had seven and a half meters of rain. This year, we're tracking for about six and a half meters. One of the things I've been working with the regulatory board on is essentially trying to share some of the responsibility and having it added into building codes that if your building is a certain size, that you are, you're responsible for that stormwater because there aren't drains big enough. And it's also, it's a resource that having it go into the ocean is just wasteful. Uh, and, and there's a lot, uh, and there can be a lot of learning around the world from people who also ex experience extreme rainfall. And I know we've done, we, we, I, I've worked with people around the world to try and share that. But Louise, you're going to try and summarize what's been a fantastic session. Hi everyone, uh, it's just not a small task to kind of summarize all that's been shared today. It's been a wonderful session. I mean, I think uh, today's session has been a really useful insight into how uh, taking a total value approach can help us deal with these wider challenges and including factors such as decarbonization, environmental degradation. And we've talked about some of the challenges that are involved in that. So the complex systems that we're looking at and complex valuation of how we look at uh, new 
and nature-based solutions. Uh, we've also talked about the kind of change in expectations on the part of the regulators, on the part of uh, utilities and how people are not necessarily expecting basic service provision and how we need to go beyond that. But we've also heard about some emerging themes uh, that are showing how we can tackle these issues. So the role of collaboration and partnerships is going to be key going forwards. We've talked about uh, the fact that it's not necessarily uh, aiming just for green infrastructure that we want to aim or it will end up with a hybrid approach to best meet the, the needs of you know, our changing water system and the needs of climate change. And I think the examples that we've had today, whether that's in Mansfield, in Maine, in uh, South Africa, um, are just the forefront of these new and future opportunities, uh, which we're looking to, to develop so that our water systems can better benefit uh, society and the planet. Thank you all for joining. So my challenge to you is to bring your stories back into next year's Water Week and subsequent years Water Week. Bring your stories and experiences back so we can all share our thoughts, challenges. Thanks for joining. It's been a great session.